Uh, before our next presentation, someone reminded me of something during the break that I forgot to do. And I think it's a very important thing to do. I, I get sometimes too caught up in what's going on early on. And that, especially since a lot of our sessions are dealing with Native American culture and the people of this region, I did not do a land acknowledgement, which we typically do at events at Northern. So I'd just like to say that our university resides on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe. We are the first university in Michigan to have a Native American studies major. The first graduate set program graduated recently. Our core values as a university are inclusion, and this is about recognizing history and moving forward as one community. So we always want to, uh, to state that before we begin any event. So I apologize for not doing that at the very beginning, but I thought it was very fitting to do so before our next speaker, Ms. Sarah Daniels. Uh, Sarah is a candidate for a master's degree here at Northern, and I became aware of her uh, work on Jane Johnson's school schoolcraft when she applied for a job with me, only to find out that she didn't qualify because she already had a job. And uh, graduate assistants can't have two jobs on campus, for good reason. Um, and, but her sample, the writing sample she sent me was this wonderful paper about Jane Johnson's schoolcraft. And so I said, well, yeah, you can't have the job, but would you speak at the Sondriger Symposium? And she said, yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh, thank goodness, because I need somebody to do this. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome up Sarah Daniels. Good morning. Um, can everyone hear me OK in the back? OK, awesome. I've been told I'm a quiet speaker, so I wanted to make sure. Um, but yeah, as, as we've said, my name is Sarah Daniels. Um, I'm an MFA program candidate here in creative writing specifically. Um, so one of the things I love most in life is poetry. Um, so I want to take a moment and just thank everyone for taking time out of their morning to come here and to listen to some wonderful, wonderful presentations that we've already heard so far, um, as well as to take some time to talk about one of the things I love the most, which is poetry right now. Um, and I specifically, I want to talk about a poet who I think is really important, um, both in terms of history and literary um, history in Michigan. And I think she's one of the most important voices in early Michigan history, um, and also one of the kind of least remembered or least talked about, unfortunately. But before I kind of talk about the name on the screen behind me, I do want to ask you a couple questions. So the first one is I want you to think back to your high school or middle school, maybe college experience and think about what poets and authors you remember being asked to read. Um, so maybe what, what was your 10th grade English class reading list? Or if you're anything like the classes I sat, sat through um, in middle and high school, what kind of poets did people like sigh at and roll their eyes at? So just keep those, those names in mind for a moment, if you would. Because my second question is, where have you heard the name Schoolcraft before? So if you've been here earlier this morning, you've heard it a lot so far, right, in the past couple of hours. But if you've lived in Michigan for any period of time, you've heard it outside of this room as well. Um, Schoolcraft College in Livonia, where my father graduated from. Um, Schoolcraft Road in Detroit, a major road there. Um, even Schoolcraft County, which is just a couple, or one county over, I believe, from Marquette County. So the name is everywhere in Michigan um, and in Michigan history. And most of us have heard it in several different contexts. And of course, it refers to Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, who we just spent time talking about, um, who was an ubiquitous figure in early Michigan history um, and contributed a lot in terms of ethnology and recording Native American histories, um, and is well known for his contributions um, in the Michigan State Legislature, as well as the expeditions he went on. But fewer of us have, have heard of, in any substantial way, his first wife, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, um, it's a shame that we haven't heard as much about her because she's a really fascinating person and a really fascinating poet. Um, she was a poet. She wrote over 50 poems that have been recorded and saved. Um, and she also was one of the first people to write down um, these sort of traditional or oral, usually orally told Ojibwe stories. Um, and, and I want you to think back for just a moment to those names you thought of on the first slide. Um, the, the people you read in high school or middle school. You might have thought, you know, William Shakespeare, maybe George Orwell's 1984. I think I read um, Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby three separate times for different teachers. So a lot of the same names come up a lot. And it's something that a lot of schools are trying to change now, this sort of, these reading lists that are predominantly male 
and predominantly white and tell the same stories of the same groups of people who have been in power for decades in this country. Um, and I wanna talk about Jane Johnson's Schoolcraft because I think she's a good counterbalance to some of these more traditional reading lists. Um, her writings and poems weren't really quote unquote rediscovered until, until the early 2000s, about a century and a half after she wrote them. But now that we have rediscovered them, I think it's time to, to try to find her authentic voice as a writer um, and as a figure in Michigan history. She's important for several different things. She was the first in many different categories. She's the first known Native American woman writer that we have in what's now the United States. She's the first known Native American literary writer across the board that we know of. And she's also the first known Native poet and the first known, again, writer of indigenous stories um, in which she's recording down these orally told Ojibwe stories. So she's really important in terms of literary history, but she also lived in a really interesting time. Um, she was born in the year 1800 in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and she was born to a powerful and influential family in that area. Um, her mother's side of the family was Ojibwe. Her grandfather uh, was a Ojibwe um, war chief and civil leader. And then her father was a Scots-Irish fur trader in the area. And between her two parents, they had um, really powerful connections across their community, um, both with the European fur traders, with the Ojibwe community living there, as well as with the Mati, who were a blend of indigenous and European ancestry. And because they had an extensive network in con of connections, they were of help to Henry Schoolcraft when he moved to Sault Ste. Marie in the 1820s as part of his role as an Indian agent. Um, and Jane navigated a world that encompassed a number of early American um, cultural kind of signposts, if you will. She, was, she lived among fur trading, um, the effects of colonization, indigenous lifestyles and traditions, as well as the Mati community. She was bilingual. Um, she grew up speaking Anishinaabe Moan as well as English. Um, and she was also fluent in multiple literary or narrative traditions. She would have grown up hearing Ojibwe stories from her mother, as well as reading um, in her father's extensive library, more European literary traditions. And in fact, as a young woman, she went actually to travel Scotland and Ireland with her father, which you can imagine would be a really unique trip to take at that time. It's not something people usually did for fun, right? You couldn't really hop on a plane and, and jump over there. So she really, she occupied and was able to navigate a number of different literary, cultural, and linguistic spaces that make her just a really fascinating person to read about. And a great example of this is just the many names that she took on throughout her life. Her Christian first name, obviously, is Jane, um, but she also wrote under several different pen names throughout her life. She wrote under the name Rosa, as well as Leelanau. Um, and if you're from Michigan, you might recognize the word Leelanau. There's Leelanau County. And actually, Henry Schoolcraft did name that after his wife. That was one of the counties that he named. Um, and it was a pen name that she wrote under. And also, as we touched on earlier, she had her name in Anishinaabe Moan, which translates in English to woman of the sound the stars make rushing through the sky, which is a really beautiful name, um, but I think also emblematic of the way that she was able to navigate different cultures and languages um, and literary spaces, um, using kind of different personas and different names to represent herself. She's also a really important voice um, to remember because of what was happening around her and, and the kind of snapshot of life that she captured during this. She was born in 1800, but she didn't die until 1846. So that means she lived through a period of tremendous change um, in this territory. She lived through the 1836 and 1837 creation of Michigan as a state. Um, she lived through the early 1830s in which, I mean, we talked about the Indian Removal Act earlier. Um, but she lived through the beginning of the Trail of Tears, right, which we now know as, as ethnic cleansing, um, in which 60,000 or roughly 60,000 indigenous people were displaced, and many, of course, died along the way. And she also lived on sort of these shifting lands. There was great change going on in her community and in um, her territory at the time, um, in part we'll talk about later, due to her own husband. Um, but we talked a bit earlier about the changing populations in Michigan at the time. She was born when there were you know, a couple, a few thousand people in this area, and then when she died, there were hundreds of thousands of people in this area. So it just goes to show you how much life was changing around her, um, and the ways that she kind of provides us a really unique voice and perspective on a, a really fascinating time in American and Michigan history.
So if she's such an important voice and such a unique voice, why haven't most people heard of her? Um, and I ask myself this a lot, and I think if, if we want to answer this question, we have to think a little bit about the word archive. Most of us know what archives are. Um, you could go to your local university one or the Library of Congress archive. Um, and in a lot of ways, they do really important work and are, are wonderful things, um, but they're fallible, like, like most things. And archives don't always capture the full story. Um, they actually, the word archive comes from the Greek word that means the house of the ruler. So the way that we preserve history and document it has always been bound up in ideas of power. Um, you know, you've heard the, the victor tells the story type of, of slant, saying before, and that's true in archives too. A lot of times the documents that are preserved and the stories that are preserved, both in archives and just in our general collective histories, are the stories of people who were in power um, and groups who were in power. And those are the, the stories and the documents that often get chosen to be preserved um, and studied as we, as we uh, move forward. And that leads me to this idea of what we call archival silence. And archival silence happens um, when there's a gap in our collective histories when there's a voice or a perspective missing because it either hasn't been preserved in terms of documents or it's been distorted or you know, in term, it falsified in some way. And one of my favorite writers, Carmen Maria Machado, writes about this idea in her memoir. And she says that something very large is irrevocably missing from our collective histories. We're missing a lot of indigenous history um, and voices in our historical perspectives. We only have to think back to those reading lists we thought of at the beginning of this presentation um, to realize just how many voices are missing in, in our education system um, and in our kind of general collective histories of the United States. And part of the reason that Jane Johnson's schoolcraft voice is kind of obscured um, is her husband. And she had a really complicated relationship with her husband, Henry Schoolcraft. They were married in 1823. Um, and they were married for over 20 years before she passed away. So over two decades of marriage together. And in a lot of ways, it was a loving marriage. Um, their letters to each other are often affectionate. Um, they seem to have a level of respect and affection for each other. But it was also a lonely marriage. Um, Henry spent a lot of time traveling. He had a lot of duties um, to the Michigan government and to the United States that brought him out to the East Coast and away from Jane. And in many of her letters, she wrote to him expressing this loneliness um, and, and feelings of alienation. At the same time that he was her romantic partner, he was also her, her literary partner. He published um, many of her, her works that we have access to today. This wasn't really a traditional publishing. Um, he and Jane created this sort of handwritten literary magazine together that we saw a picture of earlier um, called The Literary Voyager. And this handwritten magazine they would send to their friends and family, as well as Henry's connections on the East Coast and in Detroit. So it was pretty localized, but it, it was a, a physical record of Jane's work, um, which has allowed us actually to continue to study her today. Um, so at the same time that he was her publisher, in some ways he was also her translator. Um, she wrote in both Anishinaabe Moan and English. And in some of his publications in the literary magazine, he would translate um, her original Anishinaabe text into English. And we'll talk more about his translation later. Um, he was, yeah, definitely um, an exaggerator in many capacities in his life. But at the same time that he had this personal relationship with her, he also had um, a complicated professional role that, that really kind of puts into conflict his personal relationship with her. He was on the 1820 expedition with Cass, and then he went on another expedition 12, later, 12 years later um, in which he found the true source of the Mississippi River. And as part of these expeditions, as we've talked about, he was part of an expanding colonial US force um, that was looking to develop this land, right? Um, it was looking to further the country's economic interests at the cost of the indigenous people who were living there. As well as, um, his time serving on the Michigan State Legislature and as an Indian agent, he helped negotiate roughly 15 million acres of indigenous land out of indigenous stewardship and into the control of the United States. So he was a large contributor to those shifting lands that Jane Johnson Schoolcraft lived on um, and to that increasing colonization that she lived to see. Um, and even his translations and publications of her work are complicated because they're not always faithful translations. Um, as he wrote down her poems and her stories in The Literary Voyager, he took an approach that he called free translation. 
And he used this word free um, to sort of give himself permission to alter her original text and intentions behind her text. His poems are drastically different than her initial um, writings of them. In fact, her, her works really weren't rediscovered until the early 2000s, and they were stored in his manuscripts in the Library of Congress and other archives. And people really only rediscovered them by looking through his things in the Library of Congress. Um, and as a result, her, her voice is kind of filtered through his, even as we've tried to understand her in her own right. Um, there are modern translations of her um, Anishinaabe Moan works that are much more faithful translations. Um, and we can luckily use those to kind of see the inconsistencies and inaccuracies in Henry's translations of her work. And I would like to argue that rather than his free translation, as he calls it, it was more of a co-option. He did more to take over Jane's voice than he did to really translate it into English. And of course, we know co-op means to absorb something into a larger group or to take over. And the definition kind of echoes this idea of colonization in which you know, the United States government forcibly absorbed swaths of land and peoples into, the, into their United States colonial context in the same way that Henry, in many ways, absorbed Jane's voice into his own and took over her original intentions in her writing. And one of the best examples of this is her poem that she wrote called On Leaving My Children, John and Jane at School in the Atlantic States and Preparing to Return to the Interior. Um, Jane and Henry had four children together, only two of whom survived. And the two surviving children, Henry really wanted to go to this boarding school on the East Coast of the United States. Um, we can presume because education maybe would have been more established or formal there. Um, but Jane was really against this. Again, this is not an easy trip for a mother to make. She, it's not like she could see them very often. And communication would have been fairly irregular. Um, despite her protests, though, Henry insisted that these children go to this boarding school. And this poem she wrote as a response to um, having to leave behind her children so far away from her home. So I'm going to read a modern translation of this work, a more faithful translation of this work, before talking a little bit about how Henry made changes to it. So this is On Leaving My Children. As I am thinking when I find you, my land, Far in the west, my land, my little daughter, my little son, I leave them behind, a faraway land. But soon, it is closer, however, to my home I shall return. That is the way that I am, my being, my land, my land. To my home I shall return. I begin to make my way home, ah, but I am sad. I'm not going to read Henry's free translation mostly because I want to focus on Jane's voice, but also because it completely changes her original text. He changes multiple aspects of it. He changes the meter, the rhythm, the rhyme scheme, as well as the content. Um, you'll, you'll notice in the reading of it, um, the English translation doesn't have um, the same sonic or the same sounds um, that the Anishinaabe Moan version would have. But he, in his English translation of this poem, inserts this really rigid meter and really rigid rhyme scheme that kind of changes the musicality and like the shortness of Jane's original writing. You'll notice her, her original poem is quite short. It's only four stanzas long. The lines are really only a few words at a time. But he transforms the poem until it's six stanzas long with these really lengthy wordy lines. Um, and he inserts these different lines that were never there to begin with, um, as well as erases ones that were really pivotal to the poem. <clears throat> Some examples of how he kind of shifts the focus of this poem. Um, she writes about her personal grief, right, and leaving children behind. And he shifts the focus of this poem until it's more political in nature. Um, he inserts this political slant that just wasn't there to begin with. Jane's poem is powerful because it's so personal and because it's so intimate. We see this in the first person language she uses with throughout. My little daughter, my son, my land, my home. And it's intimate because she addresses her home, the land, directly. As I am thinking of you, she writes in the first line. But Henry shifts that into a more political stance. In one of the stanzas he sort of inserts into the poem, he writes, there roved my forefathers in liberty free. There shook they the war lance and sported the plume, ere Europe had cast over this country a gloom. Jane makes no reference to Europe or war or violence in her original text. Um, these are things that Henry sort of invents or inserts. 
And ironically, even by acknowledging colonization in a negative light, which he is doing, he perpetuates it. He writes in references to the, United, to the United States and to colonization that Jane doesn't focus on in her original text. So in a way, he co-ops or even colonizes the voice of his half-indigenous wife in order pri to prioritize his own complicated feelings about their relationship and his role as an Indian agent. It's possible he knew that maybe she had negative feelings around um, the colonization of this land, but it's not his place necessarily to insert her feelings into this poem, especially when representing it as a translation. He changes other things about the poem. He changes the ending to name one. Um, in, he in Henry's ending of her poem, he writes the stanza, I return to my country, I haste on my way, for duty commands me and duty must sway. For there I must leave the jewels that I love, the dearest of gifts for my master above. Jane's in contrast reads, my land to my home I shall return. I begin to make my way home, ah, but I am sad. One of the things that strikes me about this change um, is just one word. He changes land to country. And there's something about the framing of her home that he changes here. She conceptualizes it as this land, right, that she has an intimate relationship with. He views it as the nation, as his country, that she sort of owes a duty to. He references duty multiple times, both in this final stanza and throughout the poem. So by the end of the poem, Henry has sort of reconciled or resolved Jane's grief with, by having her acquiesce to her duty to both her husband as well as her duty to her country and to God or the master above. Jane doesn't make any reference um, to the country or to God or to even the word duty that doesn't come up at all. In fact, Jane doesn't resolve her grief in any way for us by the end of this poem. She ends on, but I am sad. So despite her returning to home, despite her acquiescing to her husband's wishes, she still feels this complicated, unresolved grief. And as a result, her poem is much more interesting. It's much more complex. But he rewrites the ending so that she sort of gives in to this idea of duty to country and to home, which speaks both to the misogyny that she would have faced as well um, as the racism and anti-indigenous sentiment that she would have faced. And I think one of the most egregious ways that Henry co-ops Jane's voice is not in what he adds to the poem, but in what he takes away. There's this really pivotal line in Jane's original poem that reads, the way that I am, my being. And it's her most explicit reference to herself and her, her identity and her personhood. And Henry takes this line out of the poem entirely. The closest approximate line in his free translation of her poem makes another reference to her duty and her country. So essentially he has taken her out of her own poem and replaced this reference to her selfhood with references to the United States and to her duty. Um, he has written her out in many ways of her own poem while still presenting it as something that she wrote and she created. He co-ops her identity as an indigenous woman and a writer in order to further his own personal feelings or agenda um, and in this way, he co-ops rather than translates her work. And this co-option extends far beyond just this one poem. He translated her other works too, um, a number of poems and stories that she wrote, which of course calls into question how faithful of a translation are these other translations. Um, and as I mentioned, as, as we both mentioned earlier, Jane wrote down a number of Ojibwe stories and was the first one to kind of put these into a permanent record or a writing. Um, Henry took these stories that she wrote and published them in several of his own books and collections of stories, and often unattribu unattributed, um, often did not give credit to his wife, who was the one who taught him these stories. Um, and then when Henry Longfellow published A Song of Hiawatha, which was a really famous epic poem in the beginning, um, in early Michigan history, if you've ever driven by the Hiawatha National Forest, by the way, in the UP, it was named in part after this figure that Longfellow writes about. But Longfellow took inspiration largely from the, the stories that Henry Schoolcraft reproduced. So in many ways, one of the sort of early bestsellers of Michigan history um, is largely owed to Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, who gets very little, if any, credit for her participation in it. And there's this sort of story that I, I discovered as I was reading about Mary um, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft and researching her life 
that really sticks with me is an example of the way that her voice was co-opted um, outside of her poetry even. When Jay Johnston Schoolcraft died in 1846, Henry Schoolcraft remarried a year later, um, and he married a white woman from the American South named a Mary Schoolcraft. And Mary Schoolcraft was also a published female author, which was rare at the time. Um, so we can imagine they also had a literary relationship, just as Henry and Jane did. But Mary Schoolcraft's work was a little bit different than Jane's. Um, she's most known for the book The Black Gauntlet, which was a literary response to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And most of us are familiar with Uncle Tom's Cabin as an abolitionist piece of literature, one that depicts the horrors of everyday slavery. Um, she wrote The Black Gauntlet and co-opted that, that sort of slave narrative, um, instead depicted enslaved people as happy with their material reality and happy and content with their lot in life. It was a horrifically racist book. It was pro-slavery. Um, and the first person that she thanks in her foreword to this book is her then husband, Henry Schoolcraft, who she said supported her in this. And I'll remind you that Henry Schoolcraft has two um, part indigenous children. Mary Schoolcraft was vocally, vocally against um, the mixing of races. Um, she was outspoken throughout her lifetime and had, as a result, Henry Schoolcraft's relationship with his children largely deteriorated after marrying her, as we can imagine. Um, but in her thinking of him in the foreword of this book, the first word that she uses in this entire book, which by the way was a bestseller at the time, um, she misspells, she does a mis phonetic misspelling of the Ojibwe word for my husband. Um, and so we can imagine that she didn't grow up around many people who would have spoken Anishinaabe Moan. Um, she likely learned this word from Henry, who was fluent in it. And we can imagine that Henry was probably called my husband, often by his first wife, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. And so it really um, represents this moment in which she misspells this word and misrepresents this word um, as the first word in a horrifically racist book. Um, it really represents to me the way that Jane Johnson's schoolcraft's voice and language was sort of taken and misconstrued and misused over time. But there are ways that we can remember Jane Johnson schoolcraft's authentic voice um, and who she was as a professional and a writer and a human being outside of her relationship to Henry. One of these things is just supporting language revitalization efforts in general um, in Michigan and across the United States. Um, we owe it to the people who continue to speak and learn and teach languages like Anishinaabe Moan that we have more accurate translations of her work, um, that we don't have to fully rely on Henry's trans free translations of her work. We can also push school, school boards and teachers that we know to start integrating her into their classrooms. She's such a crucial part of Michigan history. She's such a crucial literary voice um, that to not have her taught, especially in Michigan schools, is really a, a quite a sad thing. And then the third thing we can do is really just, probably maybe the simplest and most manageable thing, which is to read her work and to share it um, in its most faithful translations. You can find her work usually in archives or libraries, as well as just by Googling her online. Um, she really has been rediscovered and, and kind of brought to the forefront more in the past several decades. Um, and I'd love for us maybe together to kind of, kind of help preserve that memory um, and further her legacy even more. And so on that note, I, I would love to end with her voice rather than my voice or Henry's voice or anyone else's to give her the spotlight that she really deserves. Um, I would just invite all of you, if you're interested, um, this QR code links to one of her works that I'm about to read right now. Um, I would invite you to, in some way, either read it later tonight or send the link to someone you think would like it or share her voice in some small way so that we can remember Jane Johnson Schoolcraft um, for who she was and her contributions to literature and history in Michigan um, outside of her husband, Henry. So in a moment, I think we'll have time for questions, and, but I, I do want to end on, on Jane's voice. So this poem is called Lines Written at Castle Island, Lake Superior and it's translated from the, um, the original Anishinaabe Moan. Here in my native inland sea, from pain and sickness, sickness would I flee, and from its shores an island bright gather a store of sweet delight. Lone island of the saltless sea, how wide, how sweet, how fresh and free, how all transporting is the view of rocks and skies and waters blue, uniting as a song's sweet strains to tell, here nature only reigns. Ah, nature, 
here forever sway, far from the haunts of men, away, for here there are no sordid fears, no crimes, no misery, no tears, no pride of wealth, the heart to fill, no laws to treat my people ill. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you. That was excellent, Sarah. So questions, uh, Russ has one. No, just make an observation. The uh, Northern, uh, Northern uh, Michigan University Archives has the whole collection of Schoolcraft's papers uh, on microfilm. So if anyone's interested, and I think the, if I'm not wrong, I haven't done any work on it, but there, there are the letters between Schoolcraft and his wife and I don't know how deep that gets into if there's the poems or anything or, or in that. But anyway, we have, the, uh, we have that on campus. Yeah, awesome. So that's a wonderful resource. Thank you for sharing, yeah. Yeah, it's impossible to read, too. Because <laughs> yeah. it's an old microfilm and it's Henry scribbling. So it is unfortunately really hard to read and to find stuff in. I, hopefully they'll digitize it someday uh, at the Library of Congress. <laughs> Any other questions for Sarah? Yeah, just a second. Let me cross through here. It'll be easier. So if you're looking this up, how can you distinguish the, the original versus the, you know, translated yeah. via husband? This is a great question. So how can you find the original text, right? Yeah. Um, there's a source I have, actually, on the resources page here. Um, Robert Dale Parker was a person who really kind of rediscovered Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's writings. Um, and he was the first person to publish a kind of a full length book focusing specifically on Jane. Um, it's called The Sound the Stars Make Rushing Through the Sky, The Writings of Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and if you were to read that, he includes her more faithful translations of her original texts. Um, you can also, there's a art, great article by Bethany Schneider um, called Not for Citation, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's Synchronic Strategies, and she includes original versions of the text as well. Um, also, if you just Google Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, um, poetry.org has a number of her poems published, and I believe those are more accurate translations as well. Yeah, but great question. Any other questions? Marie's got one. Dan get his exercise today. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was just a uh, similar question. Uh, even if we have Robert Dell Parker uh, trying to be a little more faithful, how, how do we interact with the idea that these folks are all language learners? Was there a first speaker that uh, translated the original at some point that these folks are drawing on? Because I, I noticed the, uh, a lot of it is it's written in phonetics. Like I, I can, as a, la a language learner, I can mm -hmm. pick it out and see things that she was saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would interpret it or translate it the same. Same way. So right. that I'm wondering who, who made that judgment call. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one I'm not super able to answer right now, but I think it's a really interesting point. Um, that even with modern translations, a lot of these people are language learners who are, who are translating it right. So even with the more faithful translations that we have, um, it's good to, to keep asking about how faithful they really are um, and, and in different ways that we can, they could be read potentially or could be translated. Um, and that's, I feel like that's one of the interesting things about translated pieces of literature in general is how, what kind of choices do translators make as they're trying to stay faithful to intent and to sound um, and to rhythm, especially with poetry. Um, so I wish I could answer that in a better way. Um, I'm not aware of anyone, um, any one source a lot of them drew from, but I, I mostly just took mine from these sources, yeah. Okay, miigwech for that. I had another question too. Sure. Uh, so as with many of the firsts in history, you know, we laud them, because they're the first, right? right? Yeah. And so we assume the positive about them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, we delve deeper into their history, we find out some things that are not so flattering about them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Suzette Lafleche, who is lauded as the first Native American uh, physician, mm -hmm. 
and female, and so you know everybody like oohs and ahs over her, but she was really assimilationist. Mm -hmm. She was like, hey, you know, Native people assimilate into white society as soon as you can so we can be saved. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, you know, delving into a woman who married a man who was very pro-assimilative and yeah. racist? Uh, what are your thoughts about her in that, in that way? Was she someone who thought, Jesus, we Indians, we got to get on the bandwagon and lose our culture? Or, or was it something different? Yeah, so it's another thing that makes Jane really interesting to study, I think, is the fact that she does have such a complicated marriage. Um, and she definitely, Jane was definitely Christian. She definitely believed um, that people should be Christian, essentially. So in, in some ways, she was assimilationist in that, in that sense. Um, and she more, we don't know 100% her personal feelings about a lot of these things because, again, she's so filtered through the letters that we have with her husband um, and his translations of her work. Um, but we do know that she did care deeply for her husband, and so in some ways um, was supportive of him and his career, right? Um, and that what make, that's what makes her in part so complex and, and worth studying, I think, is because she has this complicated relationship um, to the Michigan becoming a state, to being married to an Indian agent. Um, and her works being first are important because in ter be there first, but also because um, they give us an insight into kind of the, the kind of the complex the complexity that she would have had, um, and I'm not sure 100 percent about her personal feelings towards things like colonization, but I do know she she did support a lot of what Henry did, and she was Christian if that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we got one over here. I'll come get you in a second. Fred. So my question is, did Henry Schoolcraft translate her letters to him? Yeah, great question. So she, she was fluent um, in liter in both Anishinaabe Moan and English. So she, she wrote the letters in English. Um, she just was, she was a bilingual writer in that sometimes she liked to write in Anishinaabe Moan um, and other times she wrote purely in English. Um, so the only times he would have translated her work um, were really specifically with poems that she wrote initially in Anishinaabe Moan. Yeah. Are there any sources where we have uh, native speakers reading her poems yeah. so that we can hear what they sound like as she wrote them. That's a great question. Um, I didn't include any here, but I think there are some accessible like through YouTube, if you were to look it up, um, some, some readings of them in their original, original sound. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious too uh, uh, about why she didn't Write, write at least the stories, I suppose, in English. Uh, do we only, do we have any writings outside of her letters that mm. uh, survive in English? Because it seemed like she could have translated her own poetry. Yeah. I suppose that's a, and I'd be curious of your thoughts, uh, guessing as to sure. why she didn't. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so she did have writings that survived in English. Um, the stories that she recorded that are you know, traditional Ojibwe stories she wrote down in English largely. So those we don't have to guess at as much. Um, she wrote poems both in English and in Anishinaabe Moan. And I, I guess I'm not sure why she didn't translate some of them on her own. I'm, I'm guessing be just because she more wanted them in the voice and language, um, res the respective voice and language when she wrote them. And then Henry would have taken his own initiative in translating those. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Oh, there's a question. I'm sorry. I was talking to somebody in the back. I feel like Phil Donahue. <laughs> uh, a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, you know, taking the time to discover uh, maybe not so much the poetry, but the, the suppression and the translation to take one vision and in reinterpret that person's vision another way through the husband basically. Um, we see a lot of that happening in the world today where those in power are suppressing uh, voices <clears throat> and trying to change the narrative in their own, their own view. Uh, my question to you though is, um, you know, there's a plethora of opportunities to write about. What brought you to writing uh, this? This story. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy you asked this. Um, I had a really wonderful professor during my undergraduate degree at Central Michigan University. 
Um, and it was my women's writers class that it was the first time I'd ever heard of Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and so really it's thanks to her that I'd ever heard of her, really. Um, and her story just kind of struck me right away um, as one that's really fascinating. Um, and it's just a person who I think deserves recognition for her literary contributions, um, kind of beyond just being associated with her husband. And so it was important to me to maybe look into her and try, try to discover what I could about her on my own, um, because she, I do think she deserves, in her own complexity, to be understood in her own right. Um, so I hope that answers your question. But. Are there any other questions? Um, one difficult thing, and, and I think I read this in, uh, in Parker's book, mm -hmm. is that she became addicted to laudanum later in life, and uh, many believe that may have been what attributed to her death. Would you comment on that to some extent? Yeah, so she did, um, she died in Canada with her, she was with her sister at the time, um, and in, like many moments in her life, Henry was not there while she died. Um, again, their, their marriage was in some ways strained by his duties to the government um, and to his job in which he was often apart from her. And so um, she did die without Henry there and she was sick for a while before she had passed away. For years she had been battling with different illnesses um, and in part to medicate for that, she did take, yeah, she did become addicted at some point to laudanum. Um, and yes, yeah, people do speculate that this contributed eventually to um, the causes of her death as well, um, which I think just makes her even more of an interesting person to study in terms of the number of things that she experienced um, and adds another layer of complexity to her marriage, um, which was alienated enough that she did die apart from her husband. But, yeah. I think that was very common at that time of women who were suffering in their marriages, yes. often became addicted to laudanum. Often it was prescribed to them because they were becoming difficult mm -hmm. in their relationships with their husbands and it was seen as a way to solve the problem that they were having with their husbands. Yeah. I'm on my way. Do you have any information as to how did she have any further relationship with her children that went off to school? Yeah, I mean, she maintained, I, I believe, like letters with them as well, um, and a relationship with them. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure on their age when she passed away, um, but they were, I mean, they were young enough that they got to know Henry's second wife, Mary Schoolcraft, and and had a deteriorating relationship with him specifically. Um, their relationship, as far as I know, remained strong with Jane throughout her life until the end of her life. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, Sarah, thank you. Fantastic presentation. Really thank you excellent. so much.